Hello and welcome again to another program of Searching for Answers. My name is Carolyn Thompson and we think we have some really interesting things to talk about. We're still in the book of Luke and if you would go and get your different Bibles, different interpretations, maybe a Bible dictionary and read right along with us. On my right is... I'm Gerald Winslow from Loma Linda University Medical Center. And John Jones, the School of Religion at La Sierra University. John Brunt, the Azure Hills Church. Ivan Blazin, um, also a John, keep that in mind, <laughs> um, from Loma Linda University School of Religion. Now, if you get your Bibles, we're going to do a little review of Luke chapter 9. And then we're going right into Luke chapter 10. John Brunt, would you give us a little review, please? Well, one of the highlights that we saw in chapter 9 was the transfiguration of yes. Jesus. And just before that, maybe we should pick up one verse right. before. Where in are we? In chapter 9, verse 27, okay. Jesus was talking to his disciples. And he said, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of heaven. Well, and of course, that that's mean? kind of a yeah, problematic statement is. if we think of the kingdom of heaven as Jesus' second coming. Yeah, but I think that's Luke, what I grew up with. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think Luke sees it as more than that. Remember, the kingdom is coming. We've been seeing the kingdom dawning in story after story here. And I think that Luke purposely makes the very next story a story where the disciples get a glimpse of God's glory through the divinity of Jesus and they really get a foretaste of the kingdom and I think that Luke put the story there right after this statement to say mm. see mm. here some of them who were right there did get a picture of the kingdom of God and I think he expects us to see a foretaste of the kingdom of God as we see this transfiguration so right after this Jesus takes three of his disciples Peter and James and John, mm -hmm. and they go up to a mountain to pray. Okay. Now, Jesus seems to be the one who is uh, more focused on praying because it says a little later that the disciples were very sleepy and uh, they were using it as an occasion to catch a nap uh, while Jesus is praying. But while Jesus is praying, two people come. Maybe we should actually read a little yes, bit of it here. Yes, okay. Um, starting with verse 29. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, or as uh, Ivan pointed out to us before, his exodus, right? Um, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory. Mm. Notice they saw his glory mm -hmm. and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying, Luke adds parenthetically here. Okay. And then there's more. There is this glory. Jesus' divinity flashes through his humanity. They see the dazzling brightness and splendor of Jesus here accompanied by Moses and Elijah. But then another character comes on the scene that we don't see, we only hear. And there we read in verse 35, a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. Amazing, and there it ends. amazing story. Yes, and of course, this voice takes us back to the baptism of Jesus, yes. where we had the voice mm -hmm. saying, this is my son, I love him, I'm pleased with him. And I think that on that occasion, and again now on this occasion, the affirmation that the father gives to the son 
is not just an affirmation of the Son himself as an individual. I mean, the Father had always loved the Son. But I think it is an affirmation of him as mm -hmm. our Savior. He says, I accept you as the Savior mm. of humankind. Oh. So in a sense, this embraces us as well. Okay. Because he accepts Jesus as our Savior, yes. and therefore we are all embraced by this voice. And so we really do get a glimpse of the kingdom right here, and a glimpse of the fact that Jesus is accepted by the Father as our Savior, Moses and Elijah representing those who will be saved. And of course, if, when we read in the Old Testament, Elijah uh, didn't die. He was taken to heaven in that fiery chariot. Uh, Moses did, and I think here the two of them represent uh, those who will be translated when Jesus comes, those who will be resurrected when Jesus comes. And so we see here already a picture of humanity being saved by Jesus Christ. And I think I would want to add to Moses and Elijah that Moses is a representative of the law, mm -hmm. Elijah of the prophets, mm -hmm. and one of the last things that the Gospel of Luke tells us on the day of the resurrection that Jesus starts with the law and uh, goes on showing all the things that pertain to himself. So I think there's the witness of the whole Old Testament, so to speak, mm -hmm. to him. And as far as the beloved son, I mean, this is my son, that does come, don't you think, John, out of, John, uh, out of uh, Psalm 8, Eight which yes. is where that statement first occurs. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's about the king of Israel uh, on the day of his accession and the recognition of it. And so really, in a way, uh, what's being said is Jesus is the messianic king. And the law and the prophets uh, testify to him. Yes, and I think uh, that what you pointed out which a lot of people don't really understand the verse is that uh, there's some standing here who will not see death before they see the glory of Jesus and his coming. And I, I would imagine that when they were looking at this white figure because Jesus was illuminated in a glorious light, I think, and then they looked up and I, I, I would imagine the heavens are opened and maybe they got a glimpse of the New Jerusalem. Could be. And so therefore, they were able to remember that. And, and also, I think that this experience helped Jesus to go through mm -hmm. what he was shortly going to have mm -hmm. to do, which is so painful and so hard that the creator of the whole universe would be treated the way he was treated and nailed to a cross. Well, and it's supposed to help them, the disciples, mm -hmm. to go through it too, because That's they right. could lose track yes. of who he is. And now they having... didn't fully understand it, did no. they? No, but if oh. they could keep their eyes on the, so to speak, heavenly vision, yes, you know. And I think it's a key line where it says, "This is my son. Listen to him." Yes. And and what what he talks about is his own death. Maybe we've said enough about the passage that says here, verse 27, that we just read that, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. But, and this is jumping ahead, but I'm th it made me think of the passage that comes later, and we'll talk about it again, I suppose, in chapter 17, where Jesus says that um, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is because the kingdom of God is within you. Yeah. Yeah. Or some translations, mm -hmm. I think, have it is in among your, you. among you or in mm -hmm. your midst. The original can go either way. Either way, yeah. but is, is he saying, I mean, do you, do you see any connection between those passages that he's sure. saying the kingdom of God <laughs> is already present in your midst? After all, this cloud, this too reminds us of the Shekinah, doesn't it? The cloud, which was precisely the evidence and testimony that God, who was in their midst, was mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of echoed here as well, isn't it? It is, as you suggested, Carolyn, a rich passage that's layered with many levels of meaning and symbolism. Mm -hmm. um, it is addressed, on the one hand, to Jesus, but explicitly to to those around him as well. So uh, I think there's a kind of double audience. And Luke, of course, is using it to extend that audience to us, those of us who read his gospel, to uh, get the message, finally. 
Well, any more on this particular subject, or shall we go to chapter 10? Here we go. I'm just going to mention <laughs> one thing, and that is, you know, we connected verse 27, and I think you're right with what comes. But remember the verse before it is about the second coming itself, mm -hmm. when he comes with the glory of the Father yeah. and, and of the angels. And the glory is mentioned a couple of times, and then comes yeah. this glory. So this is, I think you're totally right, a kind of anticipatory event uh, to guide them through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Verse to guide 31. Jesus and to guide the disciples, yeah. prepare them for the coming events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, verse 31 explicitly uh, lays the glory back out in front again, mm -hmm. doesn't it? It kind of catches that idea and right. recycles it forward for right. us. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. And I heard someone talking about this once and just, I don't know whether this analogy works for most people, but sometimes you'll see a painting that has a foreground and a background. We know, of course, that it's all just millimeters or less thick. <laughs> That's um, good. It's all on one canvas, and yet you can see the the near, the near ground and the and the background all at once. And it seems like this brings all of that into mm -hmm. focus. You can make a it's great it's preacher, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Did that's that work for you? <laughs> oh, that really uh, worked uh, for uh, me. Because <laughs> you see, well, you get the point. You see what's happening in the foreground, yes. but you also get taken yeah. mm -hmm. into the distance in the past. That's the right. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Okay. Ivan, anything else? Or shall we go to chapter 10? Let's the book go to of chapter Luke. 10. Okay. I'm going to read a few verses, and then we'll discuss them. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others. Now, in some versions, it says 70, but they added two more because how could you make it come out even two by two? So, whichever you want, 70 or 72, and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. In other words, he's kind of preparing the way for Jesus who was going to visit these places. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. All right. I want to know why. Usually when, when we go on a trip, and I just got back from a trip, and I think Jerry did too, and you're going on one. Why did Jesus say, do not take any extra things with you? Not even a begging purse. Why did he say that? Of course, Carolyn, every time we go traveling, we always say we should have taken less. I know. Not this less. But I don't think that's what he has. No, I don't think so. I think there are two reasons, actually. Okay. I think one is he wants them to depend totally on him. Mm -hmm. And so they don't take anything along. Their success, their survival, in fact, is not based on their good preparation, but it's based on their dependence. He wants them to learn that they can go out and be completely dependent on him. That's one thing. But okay. there's another thing, too. Okay. And that is... It gives the people that they serve yeah. the opportunity to show them hospitality and to take care of them. And by doing that, the people are blessed as well. And so, you know, one of the principles we find in the New Testament, several places, is that uh, those who minister the gospel mm -hmm. uh, should be paid by the gospel. Paul talks about that. And I think that these people are blessed by being able to show I, hospitality to I them. agree with you totally. But why did Jesus say, don't talk to anybody as you're walking down the street? Mm -hmm. Well, there's always that temptation to sort of feather your nest as yeah. you're walking yeah. along. Yeah. And you meet other people, and they're from the village that yeah. you're approaching. And it's naturally a temptation to kind of sidle up to them and get acquainted with all the in-laws and, you know, family. And then there's enough of a relationship established that when you get to the city gates and the center of the village, 
Uh, you've already prepared the way for an invitation. Mm -hmm. People can hardly not say, "Well, come on home come with on us." Home. You know, sure. don't be don't be doing that political thing. Jesus says there's something very businesslike about this, mm -hmm. isn't That's there? That's right. Very focused. Yeah, you, I was going to say, yeah, stay yeah, focused. Right, mind okay. mind what you're about, okay. and let the good Lord take care of you mm -hmm. through people as they're moved to do so, but not via your sort of machinations and. Mm -hmm. Manipulation of the situation. Now remember, this is harvest time. Yeah, I yeah. mean, this is harvest time, and yeah. you've got you got to do your business. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you can't be waylaid, so yeah. to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking mm -hmm. whatever they give you. Mm -hmm. Don't be picky. For the worker deserves his wages. Now, do not move around from house to house. Now, I looked up what the, about the verse that says the worker deserves his wages. I guess there were some false priests who went around and saying, you know, I can stay here for three days mm -hmm. and uh, I'll just eat and drink with you. And, but I won't do any work. Um, what is your explanation of that, John? Well, there is always that temptation to sort of work the system after there you've kind of exhausted. <laughs> you know, the uh, fact is that uh, the old saying, after three days, guests and fish have something in common. They don't smell quite as well. Yeah. And so then you move on to the next, you move on to the next neighboring house and you kind of keep hopscotching around. Actually, um, you're not to do that. When it's time to go, you just go to the next village. Mm -hmm. Don't don't hang mm -hmm. out here, kind of um, exploiting. There is a system of exchange implied here, however, and it is one of spiritual blessing uh, in exchange for physical support. You are, Jesus says, to heal the sick. Mm. And so they come in as these itinerant, wandering, wandering sort of charismatic figures who do have the ability to lay hands on people and maybe cast out evil spirits as they report to Jesus afterwards, bless them in one way or another, heal illnesses. And uh, so there is indeed an implicit kind of contract, a tacit understanding that both sides give and both receive in this. All right, verse uh, 10. Ivan, what about if they go into the town and they don't treat the disciples, these 70 that went different places? They say, peace be unto you, but they don't like these people. They don't give them a room. They don't give them anything to eat. They're not interested in the message. Even the healing they did doesn't help. And what does Jesus say about that city, Ivan? Well, it's it, it's not very a very nice picture, mm -hmm. right? I tell you, on that day, it will be more tolerable for Sodom, Sodom than for that town, the town that gives no hospitality mm -hmm. to his disciples, mm -hmm. and really perhaps shrugs off their message. Because keep in mind, their message is always even when the disciples are to wipe their feet of the dust that it, they accrue from that town. They're still to say at the end of verse 11, notice, mm -hmm. yet know this. You say that to the town. The same message they were giving in the first place. The kingdom of God has come near. Mm -hmm. So they're not left without testimony. Uh, well, I'm mad at you and I'm leaving, but mm -hmm. uh, here's the message. You don't seem to want to receive it, but I want you to know. Mm -hmm. We want you to know mm -hmm. the kingdom of God has drawn near. Don't forget that point. Mm -hmm. And maybe that works as time goes on, maybe that carries some kind of force. Yeah. Maybe there's a turnabout, yeah. you know. It's something. a seed planted. Mm -hmm. right. Interestingly enough, it's a double message. They are advanced people, advanced men for Jesus. He sends them where he intends to go. But this is about more than Jesus person himself. It's about the kingdom ultimately, isn't That's it? That's right. So we see that kind of double thrust right. there, don't we? And the, the thing about it is that's so impressive and I think we've said it basically, but that is that the kingdom of God has come near to you. I mean, it's, I mean, when, when you know, verse nine, I don't think we read that, but cure the sick who are there mm -hmm. and say to them, mm -hmm. the kingdom of God has drawn near. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And I understand that to mean through these healings yeah. that are taking place, yeah. recognize that the kingdom is at work now, yeah. mm -hmm. not just in the future, yeah. but now. Mm -hmm. God is intervening in human lives at this very moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see? These are samples, yeah. aren't they, mm -hmm. of the kingdom's advance. You know, in chapter 8 and 9, it goes, tell them the kingdom has drawn near, and then cure the sick. Mm -hmm. yeah. Curing comes second. Yes. Um, you know, in other words, cure the sick as an evidence of the kingdom. Here, cure the sick <coughs> and interpret the curing. Mm -hmm. Kingdom's here. Good yeah. point, mm -hmm. Ivan. <coughs> yeah. See? Okay. <coughs> so. All right. Chapter, th um, we're still in mm. chapter 10, and we'll start with verse 13. Woe to you, Chorazin, is that how you pronounce mm -hmm. it? Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. Now, what is that all about? Is everybody in these cities condemned? Or is it an overall, an overview of the problems they have? It's about repentance, I think. Yeah. Isn't that it? Go ahead, Jerry. Well, it's not a, it's not a particularly cheerful <laughs> message <laughs> if you happen to be there in Capernaum, no. I suppose. Um, and it is, not all of the words that Jesus speaks, it seems to me when I read the Gospels, are full of sort of sweetness in life. Mm -hmm. there, um, there's that prophetic sense of judgment that is true. Very that serious. It's very, this, that's exactly the right way to mm -hmm. put it. I think. These are serious matters mm -hmm. and they're, they're confronted with an opportunity to repent, but if not. And of course it has that special <coughs> barb to it that would have been um, very distasteful to them that he mentions the very people that they would have considered yes. outsiders yeah. and those that they looked down on. And we even have some incidents in the Gospels where we see evidence of people looking down on uh, the Syrophoenician woman, for instance, mm -hmm. who wants to have her daughter healed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those people up in Tyre and Sidon, which would be present day Lebanon, not very far away, but they're the wrong kind of people. And Jesus says, if the thing's done yeah. for you, had been done for them, they would have repented long ago. The outside so insiders, are, there were a few of those too, yeah, right? Uh, outside uh, insiders. And I think that's why Capernaum is spoken of here. Yeah. Why? I mean, fantastic things happen in Capernaum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the point is, you can't just sit on your laurel, so to speak, mm -hmm. and what has happened, you know, as evidence of some sort of divine favor, because if you don't act in accordance with it and come to the Lord and so forth, what all that implies then you will be brought down to, to the grave. There is no status so high that you can't be brought low. There is no lowness so low that you can't be brought high in a way. The two sides are both. Uh, but the individuals sides. in these cities, I don't think it's a, that it talks about everybody in these no, cities. No. Well, Peter was from Capernaum, right? Was he? he? His yeah. mother-in-law's house was there. Yeah. yeah. So individuals were sure. all right. but. The overview of, of these cities, I mean, sounds like uh, God really uh, is warning them, right? Mm -hmm. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Now, mm -hmm. this this uh, verse sixteen is very intriguing. Yes, it's go, like go a, ahead, it's like a thunderbolt out of the Gospel of John mm -hmm. in, in the <laughs> the Lucan sky. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, th because you know to reject me and you reject the one who sent me, and that's the great theme of the Gospel that's of John, John. That's right. and so on. So this is ultimately a turning your back on God. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. that's that's pretty severe. Very severe. That's right. Um, so they were quite happy with, with the results, right? Yes. They okay. Are. <clears throat> he replied, "This is Jesus. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven." 
Now I'm going to stop right there. What is that all about? Is that a misprint? Is it out of order? <laughs> no, it's or exactly. What is, what is he saying, Jerry Winslow? Well, I think what he's saying is that now that the kingdom is drawn closer, is uh, you're sensing it. Um, Jesus is announcing the ultimate defeat of, of the evil one. Um, probably uh, those of us who still live in a time when we can see the results of evil realize it's taking it's taken time since then. But I think that uh, Jesus is telling them that they have an authority that comes from him and a power that comes from the kingdom that will ultimately defeat the evil one. That's what it says to me, at least. Yeah. And, and it's applied here even to, I mean, you'll be given authority to trample on snakes and scorpions uh, and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. So it seems like snakes and scorpions are sort of standing in here for almost as symbols for the evil one. Exactly. Yeah. The ability mm -hmm. to tread on them and not be injured is evident that the ultimate source of evil will be defeated. Well, John. You, well, yes. I mean, first of all, amen. I think that's the thing. But, uh, yeah, uh, you know, this, this whole thing, the disciples come back all elated about, about their, I started to say, miraculous power. And in the closing seconds that we have before us, it's enough to just say, Jesus says, yeah, yeah, I was watching Satan fall and all of this, but you are not to be hung up on that. There's something more important. Something Rejoice more rather important. That, your names are written. that your right. names are written. Well, if I, ask, if I ask my students what this statement, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. If I ask them what this statement means mm. in this particular context, most of the time, they will relate the state, statement to uh, don't rejoice at this, but rejoice at your name. So um, it's a warning against mm. taking, um, you know, a warning against pride. Mm. Yeah. But I actually, where, where are we? We're done. <laughs> 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 and now this is Carolyn Thompson for Searching for Answers. <laughs> <laughs>